This is the Real Estate Foundation, your show for massive action with proven results. Raise your life and your legacy with real estate. Are you ready to take your multifamily game to the next level? Well, you need to join us October 12th, Saturday, October 12th, for our one-day multifamily foundation workshop. We're gonna bring it to you live. We got a list of 15 speakers that are gonna go through the process of everything it takes to get your mind right, get the deal right, learn the terms, understand the markets, learn how to find the deals, learn how to underwrite the deals, learn how to put your team together, everything from property managers to brokers to insurance companies. Beyond that, what's the proper way to raise funds for a deal and how to close a deal and what to do after you take over a deal. So it's going to be a huge event. It's going to be awesome for you to join us. We've got a great space. It's going to be here in New Jersey, in Springfield, New Jersey. Of course, it's going to be a one-day event, but we got everything packed in from 8 a.m. to 7 p.m. Right now, if you put in the code workshop, you're going to get a special discount. And again, that code is workshop, but you need to go to multifamilyfoundationworkshop.com. Again, www.multifamilyfoundationworkshop.com and go fast because we've sold a ton of tickets for this. I actually was able to get a bigger room, so but that's filling up quickly as well. So again, www.multifamilyfoundationworkshop.com, put in the code uh, workshop. There we go. Got that down and look forward to seeing you so we can all take massive action together. Thanks for checking us back out. We're super excited for today's show. We have Buck Joffrey on the show. Buck, how are you? Good. How are you? Doing awesome. And well, Buck Joffrey, MD, is a surgeon turned serial entrepreneur, asset manager, and podcaster. Dr. Joffrey finished his surgical training in 2008, and since then, he has started multiple seven- and eight-figure businesses and has amassed a substantial portfolio of investments in the real estate, energy, internet, and health sectors. Dr. Joffrey is also a financial educator and is the host of the Wealth Formula Podcast and international number one best-selling author of Seven Secrets of Internal Wealth, and his mission is to provide financial education for high I paid professionals. Well, well, Buck, we got a lot we can jump in here to, but you know, I, I just really have to go back here. You were a surgeon and you decided, well, I'm going to make a jump and I'm going to make a jump into many different classes here. Do you remember what point or, or, or maybe it was a long thought that, that you said, I'm going to make this transition, what spawned it? Yeah. So I, <clears throat> you know, I, I started out like a, a very academic you know, uh, and what I mean by that from the standpoint of being a physician was I used to, you know, write a bunch of papers and journals and stuff like that. And, you know, my trajectory was really to go into academic medicine and maybe someday end up, you know, a chairman somewhere like a bunch of my friends did. And, um, and I think what happened was uh, being in residency and I was at a, uh, I was at a very academic residency. Uh, I just kind of got burned out on the whole hierarchical nature of surgical training and academics, et cetera. So even though I was really good at the game, I just didn't really, um, I didn't get super excited about it. So by the end of my training, I actually was already looking for a different ways. You know, I'm already thinking maybe I should just private practice, do something else like that. So, um, you know, residency graduation happens. My wife and I get uh, married the day after graduation. We go on a honeymoon and on a week later, uh, on the way back, I I pick up a book in a Porto, in Puerto Vallarta in the airport. And there's like three books there. One of them is a purple book by Robert Kiyosaki called Cashflow Quadrant. I had no idea who Robert Kiyosaki was and I had no interest in money. I had no interest in investing. I always thought of those things as beneath me. Um, but it was either that or some Harlots and Romance novels. So I grabbed it and read it. And, um, and it was electrifying for me. It was a huge moment. And it wasn't just like, oh, gosh, I want to be a real estate guy. What uh, it, stupid as it sounds, that book made me realize, oh, my gosh, I don't have to work for anybody. I can work for myself. I can, you know, the sky's the limit here. When am I worrying about somebody hiring me for something? So really my, um, you know, my whole thing started uh, as being an entrepreneur. and. So I started, you know, a practice, a medical practice, but from day one, because of the Robert's principles, I said, well, I'm not going to put my name on the wall. I'm going to make it something that I could phase, phase out of. And then I did it again. And then I did it again. And ultimately, I started making a bunch of money. And what do you do with your money? Well, let's go back to what Robert says. Let's put it in real estate. And initially, I was 
buying real estate. And I was like, okay, this is working. But, you know, the whole idea of uh, uh, this whole idea of, of creating cash flow that, that's going to uh, you know, replace my income, it ain't going to happen for about 150 at this pace, right? So that's when I decided to get into the date more larger asset syndication business. And um, that's, that's kind of where I'm at. I love it. And so making that transition, right? And you looked at it from a cash flow side. We talked a little bit off air about, you know, the concept of wealth 2.0. Could you give us a little bit of guidance about the topic and, and why this really needs to reflect on people who are even starting their business or transitioning their businesses from where they're at? Yeah. So it's interesting when we look at alternative asset investing um, or real estate investing in particular, um, I, a lot of people actually get into it. Um, there's probably, I would, I would guess that, you know, out of your listenership, maybe at least 50% or more are in it because of a Kiyosaki book, right? Because of Rich Dad, Poor Dad or whatever. Um, and Robert's books are pretty sophisticated. Uh, but the major message that people tend to run away with there is that cash flow you know, buy four houses, go to a hotel and, you know, your cash flow increases over and over. The problem, uh, the problem with that is it's too simplistic. As I said, it would, you know, at 10%, you know, if you think about, a, you know, somebody who's making, in my, you know, my listeners, a lot of times are making three, four, five hundred thousand dollars a year because they're doctors or computer scientists or engineers or whatever. To replace that, at 10% per year, they're going to have to invest like, you know, three million bucks, four million bucks. And it's going to take a while. You know, mm-hmm. um, so, so what I endeavored to do is figure out how can you move that quicker and, and started looking at models that other, you know, I think, wealthy, wealthy individuals use. And so I came up with this equation that I think sort of uh, makes it simplifies what they do. And it's wealth uh, is equal to um, mass, which is basically how much money you put into investing times velocity, which is how quickly you get your money back in your pocket. And leverage. Leverage is the, ultimately the ability to amplify your mass and velocity through some kind of tool, whether that's, you know, other, you know, bank money, et cetera, or something else. Um, but the, if you, if you want to go, should you want me to go into each component of that? Oh, sure. I thought we were going to jump into there. So I guess from that point of talking about that formula there, how have you used that to basically apply it to your investment strategy since we really focus a lot on real estate in the real estate space? Yeah. Okay. So let's look at it in terms of real estate, right? So mass, um, I say mass is, you know, you have to invest money in order to grow wealth, right? So it sounds ridiculous, but on the other hand, like, okay, I don't care what kind of returns you're getting. I don't care what kind of leverage you're using. But if you're not, if, if you're not investing enough to move the needle, you're not going to grow much, right? Mm-hmm. So, uh, of course, most people think that what they're limited by in terms of mass is how much money they make. And there's a certain, to a certain extent, that's true. But a sophisticated investor starts to understand there's other ways to manipulate the system. And one of those ways is by understanding the tax code. And the more money that you can keep in your pocket by investing uh, is, uh, you know, allows you to then deploy more capital. Let me give you an example of that. For me, I qualify as a real estate professional, which I'm sure your audience knows what that is. But uh, every time I invest in real estate projects that we're doing, that I'm, that I'm sponsoring, we have a significant amount of depreciation that comes in the first year. Um, because of cost segregation analysis and bonus depreciation. So I estimate that right now, the majority of uh, probably about 80% of the money I'm deploying into real estate is going to be tax deductible. So that frees up a huge amount of mass for the next time, right? So it's not just about what you make, it's what you keep. And being able to deploy more is more about, is not just about how much you make, but how much, you know, you're able to not pay in taxes. So understanding a tax code is really critically important. And, and a lot of people who are just starting out don't pay enough attention to that. So that's one thing. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, so what, what are some of the pitfalls here? Where, where, where do you find that a lot of people who are starting out, besides, of course, not paying attention to the tax code, where, what are some of the other pitfalls that you see people make along the way, not really paying attention to anything but the cash flow perspective? Yeah. So another one would be um, let's, let's look at the idea of cash flow. As I said before, you know, you, if you are looking at, 
um, 10% cash on cash, right? People talk about cash on cash. And then sometimes I think of cash on cash as sort of like, you know, in every species, there's like something like that draws like a, a mate, you know, to them, like, you know, the plumage of a, <laughs> of a peacock or something. And that's what cash flow is to a, a, a rookie investor. So the problem with it is a couple things. One is that you look at it and you say, okay, 10% cash on cash. How long will it take for me to get my money back in my pocket? Yeah. 10 years, right? At this pace, what we're trying to do here is make money, not just get our own money back in our own pocket. Second of all, what if I said, hey, I've got a deal here. You can either get 10% cash on cash or 25% cash on cash. Well, the, what are you going to choose? 25? Well, I mean, the problem with that is you're not looking at a, it, at a deal holistically because there's plenty of cases out there where I'll give you 25% cash on cash where an asset completely, completely depreciates down in five or six years. And then let's, let's look at how much you actually made there versus how much you got back in your pocket, right? Yeah. So, so looking at it more holistically as like, okay, what is my overall annualized return is critically important. So I use this concept that I like and, and is to look at velocity. Velocity I define as how quickly you get money back in your pocket. So again, 10% cash on cash is great, but my rule of thumb is any real estate deploy, uh, de uh, money that I deploy into real estate, I want it back in my pocket within five years. Why? because I want to deploy that somewhere else as well. I want to not just depend on the money I make to invest. I want to recycle the money in and out of deals. So that's where value add uh, becomes really significantly important in, in my paradigm. So um, for example, uh, if, I don't know if this might be too much detail, but one of the uh, strategies that we use is in, um, you know, we, we primarily deal with larger assets because because I syndicate. And so there's a, you know, we might have an asset that's, you know, $25 million or something like that. And um, we have, we get these loans from Freddie Mac that give 100% loan to value and 100% loan to value covenant. But we don't take 100% loan to value. We're not doing that, right? What we're doing is we're, we, we know that we're allowed to take up to 100% of the value of the acquisition price, but we're going to take 72, 73%. But then what we do is we go in there and we create massive amounts of, of value and jack up net operating income. And then every, uh, every 16 to 18 months, we get an appraisal because we don't have to refinance, right? Because we got 100% loan to value, we pull out equity. And on average, about 40 months, our investors are getting all their money back in their pocket and they maintain equity. So now that's not a 10% cash on cash or 8% cash on cash. That is infinite return on investment. So that is a strategy I think is hugely important. So the whole idea, again, just being, all right, maybe you don't, you know, buy into my infinite returns model, but look at how quickly you get your money back and start making money instead of just, you know, getting your own money back. Why do you feel the multifamily space is best allocated for this model? Well, I will say that, uh, first of all, for me, multifamily is what I know best, so it makes it a lot easier. Yeah to work with what you do. But what I will say is that real estate in general has, is uniquely positioned in, uh, in, in any kind of asset class to be able to do this because of the final variable in the equation, which is leverage, right? You can't do what I just explained. Like you can't force equity into a property um, and, uh, and, and drive in value into that property if and then pull out money without leverage. So leverage becomes extraordinarily critical in that whole play. Um, of course, leverage is something that you have to use very, uh, you know, you have to use, you have to, you know, it's like a, it's like a lethal weapon, right? So you're going to either, you know, you're going to use it for good or you're going to use it for evil and, and you're going to hurt yourself. Um, but when you use it properly, it's extraordinarily powerful. And ultimately that's how people become, um, not only financially independent, but incredibly wealthy, staggeringly wealthy because of the mathematics of being able to, you know, recycle capital into things, being able to amplify money and uh, through multifamily real estate. One, go ahead. Sorry. Now looking at, of course, the, the multifamily assets that you're going after, how important are they, or we'll say they are important, but what are the important market dynamics that are making for the best opportunity for you to be able to meet your wealth 2.0 dynamics? The biggest thing is, well, I mean, from the market dynamics, 
um, the single biggest thing is, you know, how many people are moving in, how many jobs are coming in and, um, you know, how many, how many businesses are moving in. Uh, I mean, that's, that's the bottom line, right? And we look at primarily at, um, you know, we, we focus on where the service industry jobs are coming in and the people who are going to be living in apartments. Um, and so that's, that's a big market driver. Um, I also, uh, I'm not a big fan of tertiary markets. I'm not, um, because what happens is when we get into situations like we're currently in where maybe the market's pretty hot. I mean, yeah, it is pretty hot, right? Um, people sometimes go to tertiary markets thinking that they're going to get better yield. But the problem is that, that more than anywhere else, those markets are really artificially, um, they're, they're artificially uh, boosted up by the rest of the, the economy, the, the real estate economy. But when push comes to shove, you got to have something that's underlying the growth. And to me, you know, um, you know, Dallas, despite the fact that its growth has been enormous for the last decade, is still a very favorable market. Um, you know, another one I like is Houston, Houston, North Houston in particular. Um, I mean, a tremendous amount of growth. Uh, we, you know, through our group, we're the second largest owner in Phoenix Scottsdale. Um, Phoenix Scottsdale is not, not as favorable as it was, they think, because there's been so much growth. But I think North Houston is, is looking more and more like Phoenix Scottsdale did maybe five years ago. So, Would you say that tertiary markets, investors, when they're starting out, feel more comfortable there because they're, they're thinking they're getting more cash flow, but then ideally when we do have such a strong economy right now that really when things change, you're just not going to have the insulation like they'll have in maybe a Texas market that just has that sustained growth? Would that be No question. Correct? No yeah. question. I mean, you had to look at, you cannot, in my view, look at a, at a, at a real estate asset or a real estate market um, without looking at, you know, what's happening in that market, right? I mean, you have to, I remember uh, actually like a, gosh, maybe a year ago or so, uh, one of my partners was, was saying that, you know, we should be looking at Oklahoma City and we should be looking at, you know, some of those markets. And I was like, there's no way. Hmm. And nothing against Oklahoma City or fine people there, whatever, but there's just nothing going on there. But even those markets, the cap rates in there were compressing as well, but there was nothing there was nothing underlying that, right? There was nothing underlying that. You could still get decent yield, but what we want to try to what we want to try to do is understand what the long term uh, market is going to do. And I think when you look at, you know, people we, people talk about Dallas already having you know gone through tremendous growth. I, I think that's true. But I also, if you look at Dallas, you get about a net hundred Dallas Fort Worth net hundred people per day moving in. Still, yeah. I mean, this is you know. You have to look for what it is. Every time people start thinking that bus is gone, that train is left, they're wrong, right? Mm-hmm. You have to look at the reality rather than just thinking you missed out and, and focusing your attention on a market that's worthless. So how is your investing style, and this may not say style, or maybe your underwriting style now compared to what it was three years ago, just based on you know, what your thought process is to where we stand in the market? Yeah. So, you know, the, the thing about it is that like what, what, what our focus on is really to change uh, the Delta in terms of the net operating income, right? Um, what we're trying to do is we're looking at the numbers we got and we, this is a very scientific approach. Um, again, I'm, you know, I'm a strong believer in math and science that tells you a lot. And, um, what you can do is, you know, if, if you have a robust enough ability to do so, you can look at an economy, you can understand what's going on there, and you can, um, you can target properties that are underperforming. The ones that are underperforming may not be the ones that have bad occupancy. They may not be the ones with the best occupancy, right? They may be the ones that, you know, somebody bought 15 years ago and would loves to see, loves to do nothing to it and collect, you know, cash flow every year because they paid so little for it. Um, so, so what, what we like to do is we look, what we like to look at is value add. Um, I think that compared to three or four years ago, like you're saying, um, I would, you know, personally have pro- potentially picked up properties and I did about four or five years ago where, you know, I just, acquired them on my own and pretty much bought them as coupons. Um, but I wouldn't do that now. 
Um, I don't think that that's a good idea because I think what you got to do, and there's, this is probably good to do in any market, but really what I'm interested in doing is increasing that operating income. So you're in multifamily and um, I am too. And so one of the paradigms I think that as multifamily investors, you should consider doing is start thinking about, about um, your multifamily assets, not necessarily just as real estate. If they're big enough, they really are more like small businesses, yeah. right? And so in small businesses, if we want to increase value, what do we do? We increase income, decrease expenses. We increase the profit. And then we hold on to them until somebody, at least, at least until somebody wants to pay that we're willing to, to sell for. So if we can cash flow, we no significant pressure to sell, right? Um, and so I think that's another lesson too about staying in those primary markets, staying in those stronger markets. Because if you go into a tertiary market, those are the ones that are going to get hammered more than anywhere else. Um, you know, Dallas is again, a very good example of that. Like back in 2008, 2009, it, it really, you know, yeah, sure. It, it got hurt a little bit, but nothing compared to other markets. Right. Um, and so, you know, yeah. what I love that you said there is that there's, so there's two points, right? <clears throat> the first one is the, the thing that can be off about the tertiary markets is that, you know, you hear so much, well, everybody needs a place to live. Yes, that's, that, that's correct. But how is that happening on certain markets and some market levels? Cause on some of these C class where people find a safety, well, that tenant base is, is just, you know, one mishap away from not having the rent. So they yep. may be living there, but they're living there basically rent free because they can't pay you. And yep. so when you go into these markets like Dallas, where you have so many jobs coming in, so many more opportunities and just the, 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 the installations there because of just really the income levels. And the other point is just treating, treating properties like businesses, right? It, it takes away so many things. But if you do go in there and look at it from a business perspective, it, it sheds a whole new light because now you're not getting to the point where you're getting caught up in, in just buying an apartment building. You're treating it just like a business. And now you can basically look at that investment, whether you were going to buy, you know, an apartment building or a gas station or, a, you know, a, a Chick-fil-A franchise, you know, what, what that would be and how you could basically source your investments. What, how, how have you used that in, for your in investment criteria to, because you've, you've done so many different investments, right? So we're talking about multifamily today, but you've also done that to now, you know, work in the energy and internet and health sectors. How have you transitioned to look at multifamily from a business perspective that's also helped you for your other investment styles as well? You know, I think, I think multifamily for me is um, a pretty unique thing. I mean, one of the, one of the beauties for me in multifamily is I look at it as a, um, from a business standpoint, is an extremely stable and uh, safe business if run in competent hands, right? Um, you know, the, the thing is that at the end of the day, as you mentioned, and you're absolutely right, people need a, a roof over their head. And if there's places and there's jobs with tremendous growth and population, um, you should be in pretty good shape. You know, there is a, l a level of, of fudge factor there. And that, if you look at a, a multifamily, if you look at multifamily real estate, it's baked into the price. Like we forget about this as real estate investors, right? When we talk about, you know, cap rates and we talk about cap rates of six or seven. Um, if you look at them through the lens of, of a valuation on a business, those are incredible valuations, right? Yeah. Um, like think about this, like, uh, you know, if you are, you know, cap rate of 10. I mean, we don't see cap rates of 10 anymore in any, you know, any, any real estate of consequence or significance. Um, but if you, it, what that really means is that you're selling a property for 10 times profit, right? So in the small business world, 10 times profit is a pretty darn good valuation. Mm -hmm. It's a really good valuation. And there's a reason for that, right? Because ultimately valuation is based on the level of risk, right? And so what, what's baked into those numbers is the idea is that there's substantially less risk in having a brick and mortar asset that you know, has been essentially functioning for as long as the asset has existed as a business, right? Yeah. Um, you know, people talk about businesses all the time and you know, how old they are and a 100 year old business is a big deal. Look around you in a major city how many multifamily uh, buildings that you see that are well over a hundred years. Mm -hmm. That's how stable these businesses are. And, um, 
And so it's, it's a little bit of a paradigm shift. But for me, what I think is I've got these other businesses and they make, you know, they make money, right? But they're, they're volatile. They're volatile. So um, I think Robert Kiyosaki said it best, you know, when he says he uses his businesses to buy his real estate. So that's, that's the same with me. I use these volatile businesses and take, you know, these, these cash flows that come off at a lot, you know, stronger, um, I guess, cap rates, whatever you want to call them. Sure. And then, uh, and then I converted it into stable money in the form of real estate. So that's, I mean, that's the interplay for me. Yeah. I love it. I love it. So use your businesses and the cash flow for your businesses to, to fund your investments in real estate. That's great. And what is the next three to five years look like for you? What, what is your focus? Well, it, it's, it's funny because what I've done is, um, you know, in reality, you know, I finished training less than 10 years ago. So things have changed abruptly and dramatically multiple times over for me in the last 10 years. So it's hard to say. Um, but, uh, one thing I will say is that, um, that I will say is that one of the lessons I have in being, um, a serial entrepreneur is that, you know, one of the problems that entrepreneurs like me have is sometimes not sticking with something long enough to really let it develop and, um, you know, to, to start chasing a lot of other shiny things. But the beauty of what I'm doing now is thinking it's so infinitely scalable and, um, and I think if we, and if it's managed in such a way with discipline that it can be just scale enormously. So, um, you know, right now, um, you know, I've got, you know, I've got this accredited investor equity group and we've got probably about $250 million worth of, of real estate under management. Um, you know, and just keep going and, you know, hopefully hit a billion dollars in three years. And, um, I think, uh, for your investors, I think multifamily real estate continues to be a really good place. Let me, one last thing I would point out is people are worried so much about the economy and, you know, we're too hot, et cetera. You know, this bill, um, this bill that, uh, the, the Democrats and, and Trump, uh, just are agreeing on is like pumping in $2 trillion more into the economy, right? What does that mean? Ultimately, if, if on a, you know, you don't have to understand economics very much to understand what that means is that that is welcoming inflation, right? That's saying, okay, we're just going to take this debt. We're just going to dilute our money even more. And that contributes to inflation. So if you believe that inflation is in fact, you know, uh, guaranteed virtually over the next, you know, several years, putting your money in real estate is a very, very smart idea because those, that money is going to inflate and your debt is actually going to eradicate hmm. because inflation actually takes away debt. It makes it worth less. It chips away at it. So it's a great place to be. I love it, right? And, and again, on that topic too, people, you, you do hear a lot that people are waiting, but, but again, in this business, you still have to be active. Even if you're waiting, you, you need to be out there building your network, you know, building your investor database, having your connections, talking to people. Because ultimately, by the time you wait and wait for this supposed downturn, when it comes, when it doesn't come, well, you've been on the sidelines and you don't even realize it's happened. And now it's probably going back up and you, you always are missing the cycle for whatever cycle you're, you're waiting for. So being active, using everything that's being built into multifamily is a great thing. Now, in terms of just your productivity, you have so many different businesses going on. You have basically 250 million in uh, multifamily assets under management. What are some of the key principles in your life and in your day that allow you to be most productive? You know, I'm just like, um, uh, what, what's, what's interesting for me is that like, I don't feel like I'm, uh, I definitely don't, you know, I'm not working 60, 70 hours a week, right? Um, I'm probably working in six hours a day, you know? And, um, and for me, what it is, is just about being very, very uh, focused hmm. and drawing lines about when, uh, when I'm done. And, and I, I'm going to get this done today. This is going to take me so much time and I'm going to get it done. And um, I don't let a lot of distractions happen. I'm pretty disciplined. And, um, you know, I've got, you know, three little girls, uh, they're 10, six and four. And, um, uh, you know, I, I, you know, I spend a lot of time with them. I have a tremendous amount of flexibility, but you know, the thing is that what you realize is that people go to day jobs a lot of times 
how much of that eight hours a day they actually put into work. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I, and I've been there, right. I've been, I understand that it's like, if you really narrow it down, like how much work was done, it might be half of that at yep. most. And so if we can do that and be disciplined that's and it nice. certainly helps, it helps when you're doing something that you like doing because then it's not like you're not looking for an excuse. So you're like, okay, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this for three, four or five hours really intensely and I'm done. So that's the way it works. Yeah. You have a um, word you live by or, or a company motto. Words I live by. Um, yeah, I, I'm sure I do. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, for, at the end of the day, you know, for me, like I think um, a big, uh, you know, I think a big um, part of the way I live is I just try to, um, I try to take, take myself out of the context of what the rest of the world is doing. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, I don't, I, I think that, um, the idea that, that people have that they have to do for a living is to work for somebody else and to, you know, to, um, you know, if they, they live in a place that they don't want to live, they, they'll keep living there. If they're doing something for a living that they don't want to do, they'll keep doing that for 20 years or 30 years. Uh, I just, I tend to figure out that I don't like something. If I don't like something, I move on very quickly. And uh, you know what? You'll, you'll land on your feet. You will land on your feet, but if you waste 20, 30 years doing something you don't like or, uh, you know, living somewhere you don't like living, then, then that's a shame. Like, let me give you an example. A few years ago, we were in Chicago um, and we moved to Santa Barbara about three years ago. It's just because we, we kept uh, vacationing in Santa Barbara and uh, go to this beach house every August for like five years straight. And um, one summer, I was just with my wife, I was like, why don't we just move here? I mean, we come here every August and it's like, we come here because we love it here. Why, what, why don't we just move here? Why are we in Chicago? Uh, she says, I don't know why you tell me. I love to move here. <laughs> so at the time, I couldn't do that, right? I couldn't do that because I was too still entangled with these businesses I have in Chicago, the medical stuff. And so I said, okay, well, here's what I got to do. I have to figure out something that will allow me to, you know, to leave this business and have it run on its own and me start something else that I can do without location dependence. I know it's easier said than done, but sometimes we completely underestimate our own ability to make things happen if we have to make them happen. And so sometimes being able to just say, all right, if I had to do this, what would I do? Sometimes that can be enough. And that's, that's kind of the way I live my life. So well put, so well put in terms of going from 250 million to, to a billion or just really just growing the master portfolio. What is the big why behind that? You know, I think um, like anybody else, uh, it's, it's about um, uh, like anybody else, it's about trying to, you know, grow your own, um, your, your own wealth and legacy, et cetera. But I think um, when I think about what the real why is, it's something a lot more simplistic um, and it's in my DNA. And that is that as an entrepreneur and I know entrepreneur first, right? I mean, um, I remember having my first conversation with uh, Tom Wheelwright, who's my CPA. I don't know if you know Tom. And he, um, he went through, we went through all the things I do and he said, okay, so let me get this straight entrepreneur who happens to be a doctor. Right. And I said, yeah, that that's pretty much uh, correct. But, um, you know, I think, I think the thing with entrepreneurs is that they do things because they're fun and they do things because they're interested. And the way we keep score is by numbers, right? We keep score by how much money you make or how much money you have under management. Because, because for any one of my businesses, I did it because it was a challenge and it was fun. I knew I won or I was winning or I did what I want because I made a bunch of money from it, right? So that's probably underlying the, psych- the psychology or maybe even the psychosis. I don't know, but, but that's really what it is. I love it, right? So doing fun and interesting stuff and using the money to really just give you a scoreboard to track how you're doing with it. That's exactly. awesome. Just a game. So Buck, this, this has been awesome. Thank you so much for coming on the show. For, for people that want to learn more about you, find your podcast, you know, what's, the, what's the best way to contact you? 
Yeah. So, um, you know, I get the podcast. It's Wealth Formula Podcast. Your usual places, iTunes, Stitcher. Um, we're on YouTube as well. Um, and other than that, you know, there's uh, certainly wealthformula.com, some resources there. Um, I have a, what I call wealth 1.0 book for people. I probably is, uh, not, you know, people in your group are probably too sophisticated for it because it's really about cash flow and real asset investing called Seven Secrets of Eternal Wealth, which you can, you know, get from just um, even texting me 44222 and um, putting in wealth formula, which is just one word. If you do that um, in text, we can uh, email you back the, the PDF copy of the book. So yeah, that's about it. But uh, yeah, I would love to, um, love to uh, have people uh, listen to us if, they, if any of this message resonates. This is great. Buck, I appreciate it, man. This has been great. Thanks so much for coming on the show. You bet. Thank you. Well, thanks for having Buck Joffrey on the show. This is Jason with the Real Estate Investing Foundation podcast. Thank you to all you, the listeners. Have a great day. Bye now. Mm-hmm.